currently yeah. working on the Klang Valley Mass Rapid. during my university time uh, and uh, I started with Gamuda about two years ago uh, started off uh, as a plant engineer Oops. I started off as a plant engineer and uh, I started doing research Oops, does that work? Okay. Come on now. Okay, alright, great um, Yeah, so started doing research, uh, I looked into autonomous tunnel boring machines and on the side uh, we are also working on cool robotic arms that change our cutter disks, uh, looking at data acquisition and also sound monitoring and uh, identification. Um, so yeah, uh, a little bit about my previous work. Uh, I've worked mostly in C and MATLAB previously in university. So I started off loving programming because of like, uh, my university had a project about building chess engines. Uh, so we started building uh, a system as a part of a project. Uh, so you are able to play against the computer, computer makes moves against you. So that was just, you know, basic min-max sum algorithm, um, things like that. Um, my third year project was based on microscopes. So using microscopes to detect cancer. So you would have a, first part of the problem is how do you scan uh, irregular tissue sample and get it to um, scan it efficiently without scanning blank space. Uh, so I was using a Bayesian uh, model with that. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we achieved some quite good results. Um, next thing I did was uh, with drones. So uh, with drones, there was this whole thing about can you land a drone just using the camera? Because you know you can skydive, right? And you can sort of tell how far you are off the ground so that you know when to scream, right? Uh, so uh, the thing is that we were able to show that using non-linear dimensional dimensionality reduction, you could actually tell how far you are off the ground just using the camera. So that was my previous work, uh, mostly in C and MATLAB. Uh, then I joined Gamuda. So Gamuda is a construction company, uh, I don't know, have you guys heard of Gamuda before? Yeah, uh, you might be staying in some of our properties as well, you might or might not like it, I hope so, I hope you like it. <laughs> uh, and uh, yes, we do a lot of major infrastructure projects around the world, uh, we're quite an innovative company, we always try to do things differently. Uh, one of them is uh, our smart tunnel project, uh, so first stormwater diversion and motorway, right? Uh, we did the uh, KVMRT1, uh, which you guys now can write. Uh, and currently, I'm working on KVMRT2. Um, so just to give you a bit of context, uh, we are pushing new boundaries with uh, digitization as a priority. Um, so this project was sort of born out of the idea that we want to do things differently. Uh, how can we achieve that, right? Um, so yeah, just a bit of info about the line. Uh, it's 52 kilometers long, 37 stations, and we have 13 kilometers of underground portion, which is the thing that uh, I am working on. I'm part of the tunneling division. Um, okay, so my first job was as a plant engineer. So uh, pipe man, right? Uh, I'm doing steel structures, I'm, I'm installing pipes, and this is a far cry from my days in university, right? I'm like, oh, I didn't study four years just to do pipes, right? Just get me out of here, right? So I started automating a whole bunch of my work. 
uh, started coding in VB, doing my Excel sheets and everything like that. Uh, and uh, yeah, a lot of my work uh, uh, got noticed. Uh, so the boss was like, hey, you know, we want to try something. Are you, are you brave enough to try something? I said, uh, yeah, sure, what's up? Uh, now, you know, technology and construction don't mix, right? Uh, construction is literally just, uh, you know, people say, you know what, I'm just going to use my hands and I'm going to take a hammer, I'm just going to knock it until it works, right? Uh, and no one really thinks about um, how can we make uh, engineering or construction more effective, more timely, uh, you know, better planning. Uh, it's usually a lot of uh, firefighting, right? Um, so technology and construction are not known to mix, um, but uh, we have a very interesting problem, right? Uh, so the problem being, okay, we have tunnel boring machines, right? Um, they are very popular uh, in many urban metro projects around the world. Um, you see them uh, even in India, there's tons of machines in India. Uh, there's a project about to start in the Philippines where there's about 20 machines that are about to go in. Singapore uses uh, tunnel boring machines uh, for all the MRT lines. Um, so in terms of digital technology, uh, TDMs uh, are using PLCs to control their processes. Um, and also they use laser-based positioning systems, right? Um, and also they're fitted with hundreds of sensors. So it makes a very perfect case uh, for uh, a digital revolution. It's about time. Um, so, give you a brief background, a uh, bit of a crash course. Uh, how does it work, right? Uh, so, at the start, uh, if you look at the front, um, the front of the machine is the cutting wheel, right? So the thing labeled one, which is at the front of the machine. So that's essentially your drill bit that's cutting through the ground. Um, things fall into chamber, into the excavation chamber, which is number two. Um, and then what happens is that uh, it goes in, uh, we have a main drive that turns the cutter head. All the material is extracted through the screw, number five. So the green, the green thing there, that's the screw. And so we extract all this material and we throw it into our muck pit, which then gets transported somewhere else, right? So essentially that's how your tunnel gets built. At the same time, um, at, at, at the back, uh, there is something called an erector, number seven, which basically you build your tunnel lining, your rings um, in the tunnel. Um, so, uh, in a nutshell, that's how a tunnel boring machine works. You cut the ground, you extract your material, and you build your ring. Uh, and you just keep doing that until you reach your other station. Okay? Um, so, on KVMRT2, uh, we have 12 tunnel boring machines. Uh, eight of them are VD machines, uh, which means that they use uh, a type of uh, liquid mixture, slurry paste. Um, so, that mixes with the ground and supports the ground. Um, the other one is earth pressure balance. So in certain types of ground, um, you don't need that slurry paste, you don't need that liquid. Um, you're just able to mine and use the ground that you've already excavated to support the ground in front of you so it doesn't collapse, right? So for different grounds, you have different types of machines. Essentially, we have 12 TBMs on this project. Um, so let me give you a crash course in driving a machine. How would you drive a machine, right? Um, so if you see, we, these are two operators, we call them operators. Uh, and they are looking at screens. Uh, they have five different computer screens in front of them. And on their dashboard, they have a whole bunch of uh, dials, right? And they're constantly tuning their dials to ensure that they optimize the process to be safe, to be on target. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we have to drive. We're driving towards a certain location. Um, and so uh, the operators have a huge responsibility. They're there to ensure that no collapse happens in the front. They're there to ensure that the machine is on target and uh, we are getting to where we need to get to. Um, and uh, it's a big job. Now, the, the problem with this is that uh, you have lots and lots of data presented to you, right? And this is just two screens, right? So the operator has to look at this and go like, okay, well, I, I think uh, we're doing okay. Uh, roughly, I think that's fine. Yeah, okay, let's adjust it a bit more. Oh, yeah, oh, too high. Let's put it down again. Oh, shut, something else happened here. Let's move there, right? So the operator is looking at a lot of different um, screens. Uh, they give him information about uh, how he's driving. So, for example, here, that's his uh, thrust groups. Um, so that controls how fast he moves forward and in what direction. Um, if you look uh, down here, for example, uh, here he's got uh, information about his contact force. So the contact force tells him uh, how hard is the ground in front of you. Are you mining through a rock? Are you mining through soil? Uh, you know, and as ground changes, um, operators drive differently because they have to adapt. Uh, so that nothing happens on the surface. The whole point of the tunnel boring machine is that you can mine underneath a road or underneath uh, a place where people are walking without them actually not uh, without them actually knowing. 
right? So literally, uh, the surface is you know business as usual, but underneath there's a big machine taking out ground underneath you, right? So don't be worried, it's all safe, <laughs> right? Uh, and at the front, so this is the slurry circuit, and uh, basically what we want to do is that we are pumping in liquid material to support the front. Um, so the operator needs to control his pumps, um, and the pumps will be able to regulate a level in the front. Um, if, he, if he does not regulate it properly, uh, you lose your liquid level in the front very quickly, and as a result, your, your road on the top just sinks. And if you had a car on top or you had a person on top, you get swallowed down together and it's, it's a horrible mess. Right? Um, so there's a lot, a lot to monitor. Um, so how can an operator focus on all systems at once? Uh, so to control a TBM, uh, you need to control all these subsystems. Uh, usually we won't have two operators, we normally would have one, because operators in a way are expensive, and also at the same time, it's not economical to have two people, because a person can manage both, but it just takes a lot of effort and a lot of experience. Um, so steering control is one thing, they need to control where they're going, um, they need to control their advanced speed and penetration, um, so they need to control how fast they're moving through the ground, uh, how much they're excavating from the ground, and also control their slurry levels in the front. Okay. So let's get talking about steering the machine. So how do we actually steer? Uh, it's not like a car where you have a big steering wheel, right? Uh, where you're actually going like, okay, if I want to go left, I go left now, right? Or like a joystick on a plane, right? You go, okay, I want to go down, I want to go up, right? Um, here on the machine, uh, we have hydraulic rams. So these are the hydraulic rams, thrust cylinders we call them. Uh, and we have dowels. So the dowels set the pressure for these um, hydraulic rams. So if say you wanted to go left, for example, you would put more pressure on your right. Make sense? Yeah? If you wanted to go right, you would put more pressure on your left. Physics, huh? 101, right? Uh, and if you want to go up, similarly, you put more pressure on, your, on, on the bottom. And if you want to go down, if you want to go down, you would not put more pressure on the top because gravity is acting in your favor. So you will allow the machine to naturally sink so that you come back down, right? So that's a bit of a uh, peculiarity. Uh, okay, so how do we know where we are? Uh, how do we know that we're not tunneling to Timbuktu or anything like that, uh, right? We have a laser-based posi positioning system, so it's industry standard on most TBMs nowadays. Uh, an operator will look at this and say, uh, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm on target. So he needs to make sure that his numbers there are as close to zero as possible. That's the optimization idea. Um, and uh, he, he does that by adjusting his dials uh, and his thrust groups to make sure that he's constantly maintaining that. But you can imagine that it's quite a tough process because you're constantly having to monitor that and also monitor other things. Um, the, the, the impressive thing about this is that we, we work to an accuracy of plus or minus 50 mil. So 50 mil is that, right? So 50 mil is that on a 6 meter diameter machine. So a 6-meter diameter machine is about two stories or three stories high, right? So we're operating to that kind of tolerance. Uh, because if you don't, what happens is that next time when they lay the tracks for the train, the train can't pass through because it's hitting the, the ceiling, right? Uh, so we don't want that to happen. We have to operate within a very, very tight tolerance. Uh, and this gives us measurements of about one millimeter. Um, yeah, one millimeter. Okay, so we have to deal with uh, highly varying ground conditions. Uh, it's not pretty. Uh, with our past two drives for Smart Tunnel and for LRT, uh, MRT1, uh, we've had to endure very difficult geology in the heart of Kuala Lumpur. Because the problem being that uh, we are in karstic limestone. And the problem with karstic limestone is you have a lot of features. You have a lot of caverns, you have a lot of empty space. And what happens is that um, if you were to tunnel in a feature, uh, it could be the case that you know, your ground just sinks in front of you. So we've endured a lot of that and it's quite bad and as you can see, the ground changes all the time. Some areas you could have pockets of really nice hard rock, some pockets you could have soil, some pockets you could have limestone uh, and it changes within a meter as what we've seen. You could be mining and within a meter it just changes, suddenly you're in something else, right? Um, so there's quite a lot of things an operator needs to consider. But for me, thankfully, it's the perfect test ground for me to do what I do uh, because I need to test uh, an autonomous tunnel boring machine algorithm uh, and all these different uh, ground conditions uh, provide an opportunity for us to prove uh, that such a strategy that we've developed works. So this is the team. Uh, this is our in-house R&D team. 
Uh, and uh, so Russell is my project team leader. Uh, I, I lead the development on the Python side. Uh, and uh, Sam, uh, he, he leads the development on the PLC side. Because uh, we need the two things to interact. Uh, so we have a machine that has already been programmed by uh, a German manufacturer to uh, work in a certain way. Right? But how do we teach it? How do we make it do things that it was not meant to do? Right? So Sam does a lot of that and I do the thinking part of it. How do we decide what are the right values to use? Uh, okay, so this is our uh, architecture. So essentially what we have uh, that we set up is that we have very, very tiny computers. Computers are just about this big, size of a box, really small computers. Uh, they run on a win uh, on a i7, Intel i7. There's a 500 gig SSD and 8 gigs of RAM on that on it. So it's quite a standard PC. Um, the reason why I'm not considered a web option, because you might say, oh, but uh, you know, we heard a lot about uh, the web stuff, you know, the machine learning and cloud and everything. Uh, the problem is that it's in a TBM and we don't have very good internet connection to the TBM. Uh, so as a result, if the uh, internet cuts out, uh, we will have no way to uh, communicate with it anyway. Uh, so the best thing we do is that we embed a computer inside the cabin uh, which has all these uh, algorithms running on it. It exchanges data with the PLC uh, and it process controls the machine. And at the same time, we have a centralized control center on the surface where we monitor um, all the different uh, parameters. Uh, with the, there's a future goal to it as well uh, that we can remove the operator and put him in that control center. So that's the big future goal. All right. So of course you're you're saying to me, uh, I came here for a Python talk. I'm not interested to hear about geology uh, or mechanical stuff. Uh, so let's get to the good stuff. Uh, so uh, this is a Python-based control system. Uh, we've designed it. Uh, the GUI is made in Qt. Uh, and it's very easy. One thing good was that there's a lot of uh, support from the community with all these kind of libraries, which is fantastic. I mean, Qt is a is a library that's very cr cr cross-platform. You can do it with uh, even embedded systems, for example. Uh, so it's very, very versatile. Uh, and of course, we use all the usual standard libraries like NumPy, Panda, Scikit-learn, uh, yeah, PyQt Graph, and we package everything using PyQt uh, Py, Py Installer. So we package everything into an EXE and we load it onto the PC. Uh, and for communication, we use Snap7. So I'll introduce the Snap7 library in a bit because uh, it's quite a good library to use if, you're talk if you want to talk to hardware. Uh, so a bit of a demonstration. Yeah, let's drive a machine. Okay, where are you? Are you playing? There you go. Is it working? Oh yeah, okay, yeah. So this is, this is a screen grab that I got just now. Uh, while the sessions were going on, I took a video. Uh, so basically, you can see data coming in uh, here on this side. Um, this is our positions at the moment. So right now, we're doing OK. We're about 6 millimeters uh, and uh, about 2 millimeters off on the horizontal, 6 millimeters on the vertical. But that's quite good. That's very close to zero. Uh, so we're, we're still within that tolerance. Um, one thing also that we do uh, is that we look at um, Contact force and penetration. So penetration is how fast we're going. Contact force is the ground in front of you. Um, so we're able to optimize uh, according to the ground. The problem with soft ground is that you can go really, really fast, right? You could, you could be plowing through the ground. Uh, and if you plow through the ground, the problem is that on the surface, your road just heaves, right? Um, and if you are driving in hard rock, the problem is that you can't go too fast. Because if you go too fast, your tools will wear out faster. And so then you spend a lot of money replacing your tools, right? Um, so the point of the matter being, so as you can see, data is just coming in from the PLC. We are exchanging um, all the raw data and then we write values through these. So you see these DAOs. So these DAOs are what the operator would have set, but now I set it. So the operator just sits there and looks. It's like, yeah. Right? So that's the idea. Uh, and uh, we're able to see his graph of penetration, how he's doing. Uh, it's quite okay. Uh, and uh, yeah. So. This is where we're at. We're able to control um, the speed of the machine, uh, where we're going in terms of positioning. Uh, and we're currently working on the last part of it, which is the screw controls uh, and also the slurry controls, those two parts. Uh, so that is the idea. OK, so some people have asked me why Python, right? So um, why, why have you not considered other languages to use? Uh, one of the things is that I say it's really fast development uh, cycles because you know with Python, you can just write. You know, it's, it's a beautiful language. You know, you can just write fast, uh, get things done. Uh, you've got amazing libraries with a great community to support it, uh, plenty of use cases, uh, and yeah, fantastic Pythonistas to share things with and be able to ask questions about. Um, why not others? Well, 
I used to use MATLAB and MATLAB is expensive. Uh, you know, it's you have to buy licensing and everything and um, it's procedural, it's not object oriented. I prefer object oriented, um, slow execution. Um, yeah, you have to buy a lot of the extra modules. Uh, you'll need to pay a bit more for that, which uh, I don't really want to do as well. Feels like a vendor lock-in kind of thing. Uh, with C, it's, uh, I feel it's tedious to write because you have the memory management part of it and stuff, and it tends to get very, uh, it tends to get very intricate after a while. Um, so Python was the obvious choice for me, and I just started learning Python, so it was like a year ago. So I said I can't sit still. I was like, okay, I want to solve a problem, right? Uh, so this is a PLC. Uh, this is a Siemens PLC, and this is what controls the uh, machine. So. A PLC is basically just a logic circuit, so it just basically does all your um, logic. Uh, let me show you. Um, okay, drag that over here. Okay, so for example, you have this is the semantic manager, and if you click on a on a this is a function block. So you think of functions as a method, right? In Python. Uh, oops, let me just try to put it on. Make sure that it's protected. Uh, let's use this one. Okay, for example, so uh, it's literally just very uh, plain text, very simple. Uh, for example, you load, uh, you divide, you transfer, uh, things like that. So it's very simple operation, just plus minus divide, transfer it somewhere, uh, let it do a job, right? Um, so it doesn't really do much of the thinking, it, it just does very procedural things. Um, and what happens is that all the data is also stored on a database. So within the PLC, you have databases like this. So if I open that, so all your data coming from your sensors and all your data coming from your dials and everything, it's all stored in a very nice database here. Now, fortunately with Python, uh, we have a, a library that we can use to communicate uh, with a PLC, get data and read data back. Um, so let's have a look. Oops. Okay. This slide. All right, so um, let's look at the protocol first of all. Um, okay, with the protocol, it's an Ethernet implementation. Um, so literally, when you plug into the PLC, you're just plugging into an Ethernet port, right? Um, and it's not just standard TCP/IP. It's um, it's step, it's S7 protocol. So it's a Siemens proprietary protocol. Uh, and TCP is the base protocol. But what happens is that you have payloads within this protocol. So Step seven is a telegram that's built within um, an ISO standard uh, and it's also a payload within TCP. Okay, so essentially, um, it's just a standard protocol that you follow Siemens uh, documentation, you write it in a certain way, you're able to exchange information. It's a bit more intricate than that, but thank God the uh, library does simplify a lot of these things for us. Okay, um, so snack seven, uh, thanks to this guy, uh, his name is uh, David Nadella. Uh, he's a he's legend. Uh, he, this library is very very well written, and it's a C library. Uh, but it's been uh, it's written in C plus plus, but it's been ported to Python. Uh, by yeah, this guy Gizelia. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, thanks to these two, we have access to all these tools, which is fantastic. Uh, it means that you know, in any industry, if you're in factories or if you're um, you know dealing with uh, PLCs are used everywhere, including on aircraft and on uh, ships. So you think about it, it's actually very, very versatile. Um, so you just click install Python uh, dash snap 7 uh, and you're good to go. Okay, so uh, let me just show you that it's, it's very, very simple syntax, very easy to use. Uh, essentially what you do is that you create a client at the start, right? Once you create a client, you define your PLC IP, whatever it is, um, and then you just use a command that says connect PLC IP and you determine your rack and your slot. So your rack and your slot is determined by when you wire up your PLC. Um, you have to define your rack and slot in Semantic Manager, but that's that's just a settings thing, right? So once you create your client, right, um, you define your sensor list. Um, the sensor list is something that I've created myself. Uh, so basically, I store it in a JSON file, um, and I store it as okay. This is the name of the sensor. This is the DB. The database and this is the memory bit the memory address that i showed you just now in the in the database there's a memory address to every single sensor um, but of course there's a better way to do this don't don't use lists i, I was doing this when i was very naive so dictionaries would have been much easier to use uh, 
And uh, okay, so then I have a function that finds this DB address. So say you give it a, 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 a name like trust cylinder A pressure, for example, it gives you the DB name and, uh, and uh, memory bit. And what you want to do is you want to try to read the value. Okay, so once you found your DB number in your address block, um, you define your area. The area is just a standard size. Um, so it's already within SNAP7 defined as S7 area DB. Uh, the byte size is 4, as it normally is, because when you start with Semantic Manager, uh, your blocks are divided into 4 bytes all the time. Uh, and so what you do is you just say, self PLC read area, uh, you give it the uh, area, DB number, address block, byte size, and what happens is that you get a byte array. Okay? So you get a byte array there, and once you get the byte array, you just need to convert it back into a real value. Uh, and all of that is already encapsulated in the SNAP7 library. So just by using get real, you'll get back your value in a floating point form, uh, which is fantastic. So essentially, all the stuff that you saw on my uh, video just now, that was what was running in the background, just reading from the PLC. If you wanted to write back to uh, the PLC, you would do roughly the same thing. So you would find the DB address, uh, you would uh, get the area byte size, you would say read the area. So you need to read the area first. Once you read the area, you will use uh, set real, which is a function also within the library that takes that byte array, uh, that byte array modifies it, and sends it back. So uh, once you once you set the byte array, you just need to write it back into the PLC, and Bob's your uncle, you're done, right? So essentially, the the PLC does what you want it to do already because the value is there. Uh, so yeah, it's that is the Snap Seven library. It's perfect if you want to communicate with PLCs. Unfortunately, it's only just for Siemens. Uh, I know there's another library for Alan Bradley PLCs. Uh, I haven't tried it. Uh, I heard it works quite well. Uh, but for other PLCs, uh, there's a bit of work that needs to be done, uh, especially in terms of uh, looking at documentation, understanding their protocols, which differ from brand to brand. So it's quite a lot of brands in the market. And uh, there are some uh, software providers out there that do provide drivers for everyone, but it costs a bit of money. All right. So uh, let's go into a bit about the business case and uh, the history. Uh, so okay, has anyone does, done this before is the question, right? Uh, and okay, this was sort of thought of all the way back in the, 19, in the 1990s, right? So the Japanese were looking at it and saying, okay, we want an automatic direction control. And they did it with electrical systems. So the electrical systems are basically trying to minimize uh, a certain electrical value, right? Is what they did. So they didn't have much power, computing power at the time. They just did it electrically. Uh, Margot, uh, the Margot TBM in Africa, was also a case like that, so it was also electrically powered. Um, uh, CAC, the French, um, I've heard that they've done a navigation system with auto steering, but it's not really taken on, uh, and we haven't really seen it in industry. Um, and that was only in, in the year 2000, and since then, no one else has developed anything like this. So it's fresh for, for Gamuda. Uh, we believe that it has a lot of potential, uh, and uh, yeah, we, we, we think it's actually very groundbreaking. So, so, <laughs> it's made in Malaysia, so it's quite cool, it's a plus. <laughs> um, okay, so we were asked the question, uh, why has development in this area declined? Um, well, it's simple, because tunnel contractors, um, they're not really interested, they're just contractors. We just want to build tunnels, is the idea, we just want to build stuff, right? Uh, I like what uh, AirAsia, uh, the guy from AirAsia, Devin Raj was talking about yesterday, about AirAsia changing its perspective to becoming a travel tech company. I think that's probably something that a lot of businesses have to think about. You know, are we just construction companies? You know, or are we actually uh, a tech company that just majors in construction? And perhaps that changes a lot of the way we do things. You know, it affects our bottom line. Um, construction industry is slow to adopt technologies, uh, not focused on software development. Uh, they don't have projects like we do, uh, large scale projects. Uh, and of course, TBM manufacturers they just don't want to bear the risk, right? Why produce something when? Uh, something goes wrong, we bear the risk, things like that. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, for us, uh, we see that there's a great reliance on operators. Um, it's high risk, uh, training is costly, and we, are, we have a lot more projects uh, along the way. Uh, so, it's not sustainable to keep um, looking at human operators uh, as a solution to the future, but rather looking digital. Uh, and also, with stricter requirements, uh, software does solve a lot of that, which I'll show you later. Um, so yes, reduce reliance, improve process, uh, we have a pathway right now, an innovation pathway, and uh, we also want to centralize our control in a control center. 
okay of course uh, there's this whole thing about oh automation is gonna uh, is gonna you know change uh, the face of labor and everything uh, well there are challenges and the first of all is that humans love the feeling of being in control so if you were to tell them hey look uh, you won't have any chance to play with anything anymore you won't be able to touch anything anymore is that okay with you no that's not okay right we can we can spot things that the computer can't spot right um, so of course there's this whole feeling of okay uh, there's no control can a decision be explained is it a black box um, some people say oh you know uh, it feels bad that we're being replaced uh, and also there's a question about risk and liability right who takes the risk and who takes the liability so these are all common questions that we are still wrestling with um, but for us we see the business value of it um, which i'll explain later okay so project milestones uh, we started in uh, 2018 and uh, right now we're in 2019 and we're deploying onto all TBMs uh, project wide so right now we're on six machines at the moment with a few more coming online soon uh, so we've done about three kilometers of tunneling already this is our breakthrough at uh, Chan Sao Lin so 776 and 777 uh, right on target uh, we are there in the station uh, and everyone's happy yay right uh, so we are right in the right place yes Okay, so computers do not lose focus. Uh, this is a comparison between uh, manual steering and vertical, uh, sorry, manual steering, auto steering. Uh, so with manual steering, you get all sorts of different driving techniques. Uh, and uh, with auto steering, you get a very nice consistent pattern because the computer is constantly correcting every three seconds. So we look at data, we write every three seconds. Uh, we're always on target. Uh, so we, we, never, we never lose focus, right? And uh, also at the same time, um, oops. Yeah. All right, uh, optimal force and speed. So the idea being that you want to work to preset limits which are calculated by the computer uh, so that you don't exceed them. If you exceed them, you break your, your, contact, uh, your, your disc in the front, which is not a good thing because it costs a lot of money to replace a disc and it involves men going into the front, which is very, very dangerous as well. Um, so as much as possible, we want to drive to limits, make sure that we are, uh, uh, we are hugging these limits as well. Because if you're hugging the limits, there's this idea of marginal gain. Right? It's a repetitive process, and if you're hugging your limits, you're, you're achieving this idea of marginal gains. Um, reason being, uh, there's this idea from Team GB, uh, where they said, you know, um, you know you, in the Olympics, uh, they, were, they were poor at the Olympics previously. In 2000 2004, they were horrible at cycling in the Olympics. Uh, and in 2008, uh, they started getting better because they had a new director come in, and his idea was this, that if we can save uh, one percent just because you lose weight or one percent because we remove the bottle from the from the bicycle or we make things more aerodynamic uh, because of that uh, they started winning more medals because they started losing weight they started shedding like even if it's just a gram or two off the bike uh, everything adds up eventually uh, so marginal gains is the idea we want to drive uh, to make sure that we maximize uh, efficiency so yeah we keep to towards uh, steering accuracy of about 10 mil uh, it's a two times steering improvement compared to our previous operators uh, and also we've mined about three kilometers already which is quite an achievement uh, so we have six TBMs right now uh, online so three kilometers is great and we're tunneling right under you and you didn't even know it <laughs> not here actually uh, but this was a shot in uh, Jalan Sungai Bersi so I don't know how many of you guys travel to Jalan Sungai Bersi often uh, but that's right it is going right straight into the heart of KL uh, on the KL Seremban Highway so we were there in September last year and nobody even knew it, right? But that was in automatic at the time uh, and we did really, really well with that. We were, we are shortlisted for finalists uh, for two international awards, uh, the uh, International Tunneling Association, yes, you can clap, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so Product Innovation of the Year Award and Innovation in Tunnel Excavation. Uh, so we are hoping to win that in November and December. Uh, so we're moving towards an area where a TBM could be as simple and as safe to drive as pressing three buttons. You start your advance, you stop your advance, you ring build, and the process repeats again. Right? You don't have an operator touching anything else except these three buttons. Um, and at the same time, uh, one operator, many machines. So we have a control center like this at the moment. So you place the operator not in the machine, but you drive, you put him on the surface, monitoring four machines or five machines or six machines at the same time and the, the algorithm does everything else for you. Uh, so the point being that we can be very, very efficient, very, very nimble. Uh, our operators are only required to go down uh, when there is a problem. Um, so that will enable us to save on a bit of labor cost and also ensure quality because uh, we can ensure that uh, we are tunneling in a very standardized way on all our machines. 
Uh, so yes, thank you. Thank you so much. All right.